Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi Mel, welcome to the Share Your Story podcast. How are you today? I'm well, thank you, and a little bit nervous. <laughs> <laughs> And a little bit tired because I'm menopausal. So, uh, but yeah, I'm here, I'm showing up. Uh, and uh, I'm going to tell us a few stories by the sounds of it. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming. And you, you won't believe this. This is so interesting, I find, that ever since we went in lockdown, kind of beginning of March or 23rd of March, I went, mm. we went into lockdown. I've, I've interviewed a few people so my interviewing on the podcast has been quite quite low yeah but uh you're going to be the fourth if i can use a generic term and you'll correct me later but let's say a coach yeah um i know you do a lot more than just coaching yeah. but uh which we'll get into that but a person who helps other people yeah overcome some issues in their lives for for example whether it's business or personal and really, it's always really personal. Um, you're you're the, going to be the fourth one during this period, oh, wow. and I find that fascinating. I've never had like four people in a row that are all in a similar profession, and I'm actually delighted because it's a really important time for people to hear from you guys about what you can do to help them. But we will get into that in a bit more detail. So. I will ask the first question that I ask everybody, and that is, can you tell us a little bit about you? So where were you born? Um, have you moved around but a bit about your education and move into your career? And then we'll get into the kind of current day uh, once you get through that. And over to you, Mel. Okay. Um, well, I think I was born in a hospital, but I don't actually have um, a cohesive story of my early years. Um, mm. That stuff wasn't shared with me. Um, I was born into a family with a mum and dad, an older sister who's two years older than me, and a twin sister. Um, and it, um, it's not a really cohesive story in terms of there's, there's memories that are fractured, but no... no, no um, Nothing to hang it on, if that makes sense, in terms of, you know, there are memories, but I can tell you how old I was because it, it just doesn't, it just, it's just not, it's just not remembered that way. Yes. Um, so I, I, I remember going to school um, and I remember not liking school very much. Mm -hmm. um, I lived in a constant state of terror. Um, uh, I had a mum, I think, who didn't cope so well with being a mum and being a parent. She had three children under the age of, um, uh, this is a two-year gap, so she had a two-year-old and then she had twins. Um, I think she had her own mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the most the memories I have are actually of, of, of aren't fond ones of, uh, of being shouted at, of being in trouble, of yes. not getting it right. Um I had difficulties, but um, I don't think they were ever spotted in terms of um, I struggled to write. Um, I struggled to uh, coordinate myself. I was a clumsy child. And right. so labels of clumsy and stupid were kind of dished out. Wow. Um, I was regularly hit and sent to bed without dinner for getting, for getting things wrong um, and punished. Um, and school wasn't much better for me because actually I, I struggled to be in school. Um, I struggled to write. I can, mm -hmm. I, I, I've talked about this quite a bit um, in terms of my affair, uh, love and hate affair with writing. A lot of my work was ripped up in school um, right. and I was made to stay in at break times and rewrite it. Um, it wasn't until, I need to skip forward and back. It's kind of plot spoiler. Uh, yeah. It wasn't until the age of 45 that I actually started to, make sense more sense of what makes mal um i put a lot of my difficulties into the trauma box because of my kind of abusive um childhood right. um but actually it wasn't only it was only at 45 that i actually joined the neurodiverse club as well yes. um and so going back um i was constantly in and out of a and e um with accidents some of them um accidents some of them because i've been running from my head 
Um, I have a little, I've never told anybody this. I've got a little scar here on my one eye where I was running from my mom and hit the coffee table and had my eyes split open. Mm. Um, I also have nappy scars on my hips from where my mom stuck the pins in me when she was putting the nappy on. Um, wow. It's interesting you mentioned ma uh, masks in our pre-talk about are we a mask wearer or mask wearer. Our past history and present are inextricably linked. I've just mm. learned to say that word, inextricably. I That's love it. Really but it's good. Really <laughs> hard to say. Um, in, yeah, they're inextricably linked. So um, I'm having a lot of issues with masks. Um, and, and why do I hate having this thing over my face? Be and it's because it takes me back to a childhood memory of having my mom's hands over my face. Mm. Um, I've survived being suffocated by her. Um, she, she, she didn't want me and she didn't want me. Uh, I think, uh, there were attempts to get rid of me. Yeah. Um, I didn't find out till much later, um, when, um, an aunt, um, intervened much later after I'd left home, I got some more stories about my history that me and my twin sister were left in our pram. Um, and she come around and found us in our, in our pram. Um, and she ha had a sense that we'd been there a really long time. We were in wet and um, dirty nappies and she'd gone out. My mum had gone out and left us in our pram. So um, I think from really early on, um, there were signs of neglect, um, mm. not, not obvious signs of neglect. And I'm guessing in the, I was born in the 70s. I don't remember social services um, ever being mentioned. And so... I think mm. what happened in our home was kept secret as to what happened in our home. Yes. Um, and so um, um, there was always relief for me when my mum was out of the house. Um, my, my dad was a much softer um, character, but was bullied by my mum. And, um, and so um, any punishments were on, his, on, on her instruction. I think he just did as he was told. Sure. Um, and so, so it, yeah, it, was, it wasn't a great time for me growing up at all. And um, I think it's that lived experience of how it wires us up, how it fills us with shame, how it makes us kind of all these layers that are kind of, kind of projected onto us of who we are. Mm. Um, we have these lovely sayings that it's a... Um, it's, you know, you can't love yourself if you don't love anybody else. You, you know, you, you've got to love yourself before you love anybody else. And yes. to be fair, it's total horseshit, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, because we don't build a sense of self in isolation. We build a, a fractured sense of self that isn't so robust. And so actually, um, this small child with quite a lot of difficulties, mm -hmm. um, uh, was never I was never supported and so actually um, I grew up with a sense of being really faulty yeah, um, yeah every, every, there was no I think if you've got a safe space at home but school's not so good it's not so bad if you've got a sp safe space at you know in one home or school then you'll be okay for me there was not there was not there was neither um, a, a safe space at home or school right. um, and so um I kind of wonder how I survived, but I, the, the answer came from, uh, uh, um, actually, I would just lose myself in books. <laughs> mm. um, I would read lots and lots of stories and lots of books. Um, right. I didn't have any friends because my mum would see them all off. Um, mm. um, there was really unhealthy dynamic going on with my sisters, um, which my mum didn't help with. I think we were all vying for our mum. Um, right. And so we would all kind of, you know, sometimes my older sister would be my friend and sometimes my twin sister would be my friend and other times nobody would be out, be anybody's friend. So it was, it was a really unhealthy, un, un, unhealthy kind of uh, dynamic to live in. Yes. Some of my earlier memories that um, I've, I have told um, that kind of says this isn't kind of right was um, I remember we had, a, a, um, we lived in an old terraced house um, that had um, a, uh, like a veranda to the kitchen and then the bathroom cold bathroom was out the back um, yes. this old terrace house and our house was hit by lightning um uh, and it was a it was the fork lightning and there was a fireball that conducted on our um tv aerial um right. i found this out from um somebody who who who, uh, who kind of described it that who lived across the road they saw what happened 
And so it, it hit the chimney and the chimney fell down through the first floor roof. And so we were just, our roof came in and we were just um, dug out of bricks. Yes. Um, and I remember the fire brigade coming for us and my mom was more interested in where her purse was. Yeah, mm. where's my purse? Not where are my babies? Mm. Um, so she really struggled. I, I, I think she also was a victim of, of, of a not good history and so she really struggled to attach to us and bond with us and love yes. us yes um and so there, there were all these kind of moments where um I, I knew i wasn't i wasn't wanted and i wasn't loved and i wasn't cared for and i think that some of those words stay with us it's so hard to kind of peel them away mm. um uh some of <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of getting a little checked i'm here telling my story with my voice but for years i couldn't find it and so um i wouldn't speak up mm. i wouldn't show up mm. um and my mom used to say to me nobody loves an attention seeker yeah yeah and um and that was from like oh, about four or five i can remember mm. dancing around on the map and i being a little ballerina yeah and she would just you know smoking her cigarette she would just look at me with disgust and say these words nobody loves an attention seeker wow and so i would take my shaved little self off mm. stuff down the tears and go away and so when you've got no safe adult that's just not a really really good place to be no and so yeah lots of those moments of, of feeling disconnected and shamed and not good enough Mm -hmm. wires us up um to yeah. not really trust people um to not feel very safe in the world mm -hmm. so in fact it affects your entire outlook um, there's so many bits of trauma that we don't talk about um i call it the dark side my spiteful side my jealous side the part of me that thinks everybody's doing it better than me mm -hmm. and the part and and also it and um, the ability then to accept and ask for support because you don't really have any ha any faith in people to mm. um keep you safe yeah and to look after you mm. so what happens in these early years really um wires us up for survival not to thrive yeah and so um yeah those early years i'm going to skip forward a bit i kind of um i had enough i got to um i got to 16 um and i walked out yeah. Um, I walked down the path with a carrier bag. I don't even know what was in that carrier bag. I just know I remember having a carrier bag with me. And I had got a job. I'd left at 16 and managed to get a job. And I went to work. Um, and I went to work and, and did my day's work. And then I went to the bus stop, got on the bus, and um, rode the bus um, and uh just literally sat under an archway uh, through the night because he didn't have anywhere to sleep. Mm. And um, this went on for, um, I can't remember whether it was weeks. Um, uh, and then the boss of the place I was working at um, uh, had probably noticed that I was probably a bit unkempt because I didn't have the facilities to, you know, I probably wasn't very sweet smelling because probably starting to smell a bit. Mm. Um, and she and I was at the bus stop. I always got the bus. Um, oh God, I'm told this story. Um, I always got that bus, so nobody knew. Nobody knew I'd left home, but yeah. she knew. She knew something was up, and so she um, she stopped the car and she said to me, "Do you want to lift somewhere?" And I said, "No, I'm fine. Um, I'm fine." And she said. Uh, let me uh let me give you a lift someone i said no no it's fine i'm fine i'll get i can get the bus and she just said to me get in the car <laughs> I was like, okay i better get in the car so i got in the car and she said to me what's going on mm. and so i i told her that i'd left home um i couldn't be there any longer um i i had a sense that i was either gonna kill her or she was gonna kill me um um and so um yeah i i i, I, I disclosed to my boss that i'd left and she said, you're coming home with me. And so I went home with her and she put me up on her sofa for quite a few months until we could find me a flat, a little bed sit to rent. Yeah. Um, 
I remember that my mom was really angry that I'd left and I don't think she was angry that I'd left because I'd left her but my dad was upset I had been a a bit of a daddy's girl which had put me in a firing line my mom was pathologically jealous she couldn't yes. cope with relationships she couldn't cope with the closeness that I had sometimes had with my, with my dad and so um um, my work had to field calls from my older sister and my mom who were making abusive phone calls to the office. Yeah. Um, and so they, they blocked the calls so that they couldn't get to me. Um, and so I lived with my boss for a little while um, until I got this, this bed sit, which was pretty horrible. Um, but I remember cleaning the cooker, this old cooker, um, really grimy cooker, and I cleaned it within an inch of its life one Saturday morning, only to switch it on to find it didn't bloody work. Oh. And so I ended up having another mum from the shitty landlord that I was renting off. Mm. But, um, I, I had a traumatic, I, I was there till I was about 19, and then um, unfortunately one evening I was in bed, um, well, um, I'll, I'll rewind a bit there's a bit more to this story I had a, a boyfriend at the time and he'd gone home and I I woke up and thought oh I, I'm sure I heard somebody banging on my front door um, and I'm, I and I went to the front door and there was someone hammering on it I thought I'm not opening it whoever's there is really angry and I left it and went back to bed and I told my, um, my, my, my partner the next day and he'd said to me are you sure you didn't dream it? And I said, well, I think it was real. Mm. Anyway, we found out later it was real because a few weeks later, um, I came home to find my flat burgled. The, the curtain was blowing out the side window where they'd smashed the window to get in. And I'd, I'd been robbed. I didn't really have any, couldn't afford insurance. So it was kind of like what I had w w w was lost. Yeah. Um, I was determined I wasn't going to be seen out of my uh, little flat, so I went back and, 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 uh, and tried to live there. But then sadly, the third incident kind of finished it off. Um, I was in bed one night, about 2 or 3 a.m. in the morning. I had a lounge door that squeaked, and I just heard this squeak of the lounge door. And, um, and with my heart beating out my chest, I thought, there's somebody in my flat. Mm. Um, and so I couldn't, there's no way to get out of how the flat, how my bedroom was positioned. And it was an old sash window that had been nailed down. So I, I wasn't able to ex exit. So I just thought I'll stay where I am. Yes. And I could hear, I went to the, uh, to the, to the bedroom door and thought, am I going to go out? And I was like, well, I don't know if there's two of them or three of them and what state they're in. And wow. so I just stayed where I was. Um, and I, I came probably about this close to whoever was raiding my flat because I could hear them breathing on the other side of the door. Yes. And so I just stayed where I was and then it went quiet and I was like, How, I need to get out of here. But I, but I was worried that they were still there and I didn't even know if they knew I was in the flat. So I hit the, um, I set my alarm clock off really loudly thinking, well, at least if that's going off, they'll, it may kind of send them off. Yeah. Anyway, I eventually opened the um, uh, the flat door and it was a mess. They'd ransacked the place. Um, the police think it was uh, the people. It was previous tenants and they'd ripped the um, cabinet at the bathroom and um, and tossed it into the, uh, tossed it into the shower. And he think they were they were either high or drunk and looking for drugs. Yeah. Um, and so um, I went out, um, I had, a, there was a phone box nearby. So I, I remember making a very babbled call to my partner who came over um, and literally scooped me up and took me back to his, his place, which is how I moved from Birmingham to Wolverhampton. I went right. to live, um, <laughs> okay. went to live with my, um, my parents, um, my, my, my first partner's parents had a pub. And, right. um, and so they came back from Portugal to find me living at their place. Right. Um, and I lived with them for about a year until myself and that partner bought a house. Right. Um, the, that, that, um, that relationship lasted eight years. Um, we married after four and, 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 and managed another four. But it was, it was kind of weird when I look back at it because we never had any conversations about future. Right. Um, about whether we wanted children, about what we wanted out of our lives. I was 21 when I got married. 
right. um, maybe way too young and not really knowing who I was. Mm. But I was kind of sucked in by this family unit, I think, that had kind of looked after me. My yeah. in-laws were great. Um, but the relationship itself wasn't particularly healthy. Mm. I didn't see it at the time, but my, 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 my first partner had his issues and he was um, controlling, but not in a nasty way, but in a very, um, what's the word? Um, almost kind of not noticing why. In fact, it, it almost looked like he was looking after me, but he was, he was actually babying me, if that made sense. Yes. Um, yeah. It fitted for a while to be taken care of. But I think as I grew, I didn't need that. And mm. so you get adult child relationships. And so actually he, he was suffocating me and he wasn't particularly always kind. Um, in some of his need for perfectionism, I was criticized. Mm. And so that relationship broke down and then I really spiraled. Um, and and I, when people kind of fall apart at the end of a relationship, I absolutely get it because sometimes our attachments, um, our secure base, Yes. wasn't there in our early years and for me how I make sense of it is this family had become my secure base and without them I didn't know what to do and I became so quite suicidal yeah I moved out of my um, home away from my dog and um, I rented a small place but I was so isolated and so lonely and so uh, and quite depressed that I couldn't I couldn't couldn't see a way forward and I ended up um, attempting suicide. Mm. Um, thankfully, I didn't do a very good job of it because what yeah. I, the the um, the alcohol and, and medication that I took um, actually um, gave me such a chronic. It didn't kill me, but it gave me the most um, chronic chest pains that I ended up calling an ambulance myself. I wasn't dying, but I was in pretty much a, a real agonising state. And so the paramedics came, and um, I had to drink lots of charcoal and. And, um, and, and then I had a bumpy through few years, really, of depression, anxiety, um, not really being able to write myself. And really all the time thinking there's something wrong with me. I'm, you know, I'm faulty. Rather than I've never really built the resilience, the emotional resilience and the skills for life because yeah. my early childhood hadn't given me that. I was bullied at work places. Mm. Um, um, I ended up working chronically long hours in the need to please. Um, I have massive workaholic tendencies that are driven by that not good enough self that yes. led me to break down. And I was hospital. I was in and out of hospital a few times. Um, I think the worst was the, a, a psychiatric episode where um, I can remember sitting on a bench in the psychiatric hospital and there was somebody next to me who was having a conversation with, a, you know, a completely lucid conversation with the wall. Mm. And I thought, what the hell am I doing in here? Yeah. And, um, and I checked, I checked out and, uh, um, and, and they, they released me, but um, they said, you, you know, you'll need support. And so I remember working with a, my first therapist um, who, um, helped me realize that just because I hadn't done stuff didn't mean that I uh, that, that I didn't have the skills for it. I remember sitting crying in the therapy room saying I don't know how to use the lawnmower um I don't know where to pay the bills because I eventually um realized that um I didn't need to be in this little box flat um away from my dog and so I actually went back home to my house and mm -hmm. said to my uh estranged partner can you move out um, this is where I need to be. Um, my my neighbours are here. My dog's here. You have um, a mom and dad that you can go back to. So he kind of it was quite amicable. So he kind of said, "Well, yeah, I can do that." He knew I I hadn't been well, mm -hmm. and so he moved out, and I took over the house that I'm still in. <laughs> I'm still oh, in. Wow. Yeah. Oh, great. Um, great. So I've had it since I was nineteen. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, I'm kind of snapshotting a massive yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. kind of history here. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Wow. So, um, so you're more settled where you are now. <laughs> I'm on a second marriage, which I've been in twenty. Well, I've been, I've been, we've been in a relationship for twenty years. Right. Um, I'm still in the same house. I have amazing neighbours um, who are, I guess, a bit surrogate family for me. 
yeah. um, and a close handful of friends that um, are supportive. Yes. Um, and um, I went back to school at 29 um, and uh, I left, I jumped off the career ladder at um, around 30. I, I built my way up into quite, um, quite high IT uh, roles, but I was dying inside really um, in terms of um, it didn't float my boat and um, mm -hmm. I just had this sense that there has to be more to life than this I knew yeah. it was kill killing me um, yeah. I was selling my soul for a salary and so with the help of my partner I jumped off the career ladder and I went to Sri Lanka I, I took a three-month sabbatical um, uh, took a mortgage holiday um, left my partner with the dog and said I, I've never had I never I've never not worked and so I took three months out went to Sri Lanka fed the elephants uh, bombed around a bit worked at, for a volunteer charity that wasn't the greatest mm. um, and then when I came back from Sri Lanka my partner uh, proposed um, asked me if I would marry him I said I'd never marry anyone again but you know we always say never in the in the midst of crisis yes of course. Um, so I did marry him and this time was different because the first time um, we ran away and got married we got married in Vegas um, right. because I didn't want the family um, I didn't have family to be there because it was a no, strange from, my, from mine so we got married abroad well, this time I had a, a, um, a civil kind of wedding. So that there were friends there, there were neighbours there. Mm, so it's a mm. much nicer affair. Yes. Um, and because I got married abroad, it felt like my first wedding, even though it was my second. Yes. Um, and um, I, I kind of, when I came back from Sri Lanka, I started temping and I was like, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. It was weird because I had a sense that I wanted to work with people, but I don't even like people, a lot of people. I can be quite suspicious and mistrustful and so um, uh, from, from, from history but I actually was temping and this company rang up and I asked who they were and he said oh we help people get jobs and I was like well I'm good at application forms and I always get the job so I wrote to them and said could I go and work for them as a job coach and they said yes so I worked for them for a while and then I got headhunted to work for Connections as a mentor and then I went to work in the um, Winds and Green prison with chronic um, drug and alcohol users. Mm. And, um, and then the common denominator for, for, for working with all of those clients was their mental health histories and trauma. Yes. And, and so all these people that are kind of blamed as being lazy or, um, uh, or dysfunctional, whatever words and labels you want to put on them, yeah. had abuse histories yes. and so I didn't really know what to say so I thought I'll go on an introduction course and they'll teach me what to say <laughs> <laughs> oh, how wrong could I be but how, however the 10-week course fascinated me mm. and so I found myself signing, signing up for another year um, diploma in counseling skills which I thought would help me be a better drugs worker and youth worker and it wasn't until I I'd signed up for the next course um, in a trio of courses um, that I was coming close to qualifying as a counsellor and I'd started to do placements with connections that my partner had said we were refurbing my uh, our little house and he said to me why are we putting a bed in there shouldn't we put chairs in there if you're going to be a counsellor mm. it wasn't until that moment that the penny dropped that that's what I was going to be um, wow. that I was going to become a counsellor I said I'd never worked with children and that's and, and actually my clients just kept getting younger and younger right. and, um, and my, and my um, clinical supervisor was like, Mal, you don't know how to play. And so um, I, um, I was turned down for the course that I wanted to do. They told me I wasn't academic enough. Right. And so having remortgaged the house to find the fees for it, having shuffled work to find the day off for, for the course, driving, I remember driving home, it was the Sherwood Institute in Nottingham, I remember driving home from there in absolute floods of tears, not being feeling good enough because they wouldn't let me in. Mm -hmm. So I spent my money on a play therapy course, um, which happened to be exactly what I needed, um, right. not right, what right. I wanted. Yeah, yes, sometimes yes. not getting what you want can be an enormous stroke of luck. Mm. Um, and it took me in a completely different direction. And so I studied play therapy. And then having worked with adults and children, I then went on to study systemic and family therapy. 
um, for a couple of years. And all of this wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for my husband. Wow, amazing, amazing. But also, none of it would have been possible. And I know it's not nice to think this way, but it is true of the experiences that you've had, right? Absolutely. So, because you in your role with counselling and the clients that you have who have similar experiences, you are coming from a place of complete empathy in terms of understanding, you know, having lived through so many different challenges. Absolutely. As a young, you know, child, baby, from, a, from being a baby to a young adult and, you know, other events that have taken place in your life. So, and that, that is really important, I think, because if anybody who's doing, you know, you can go and learn the skills to help people with counselling or coaching or mentoring or anything like that, but you, you will only come from a point of, well, the theory says this, you know, but if you've lived through a lot of these things, yeah. and although it may not be exactly the same thing that your clients might be experiencing or having gone through themselves, it is still a human um, crisis, let's say, yeah. that you can relate to and understand. Yeah, um, most therapists' training is inadequate. I'm going to say that, having done nine, ten years and still studying, still learning. I've been to yes. Italy to study with Bessel van der Kott. I've been to New York to study with Esther Perel, who's one of my favourite relational therapists. Um, that, but, but that lived experience, you know, um, most therapists probably wouldn't say to a client, do you wet yourself? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, those questions I will ask because trauma, the, the symptoms of trauma might be that you've wet yourself. Mm -hmm. They may be that you have flashbacks, nightmares, that sometimes you disassociate and you don't know where you are. Yeah. Um, and so to be able to know that from your own lived experience um, yes. makes you ask a very different set of questions. And you're absolutely right. You can learn so much from the books but I don't think there's anything um, that kind of beats that kind of lived experience that we didn't really ask for, but actually with that pot of shit turns into a pot of gold. Um, yeah. Not without its struggles. As I said, my husband um, has helped me write every single essay I've ever written because I don't write, but although I love reading, I, my comprehension mm. isn't great. Mm. Um, and I didn't find out until it was at 45 I decided to apply for a doctorate. Um, I was terrified they wouldn't let me in um, and they let me in and then I was terrified uh, and wanted to get out. Um, so I quit after about six months. Um, at the same time I was doing the doctorate, I had a professional complaint come in um, from a very unwell client um, and that was a two and a half years of pretty much how there was lots mm. of stalking behaviour and threatening stuff going on. Um, I went through the complaint um, there was 54 complaints made against me. Four of them were upheld. And so if, you, if, if you're if you found deemed in any way imperfect, um, our regulator stamps you as negligent. So yeah. I wrote essays and essays and essays about what I'd learned about working with um, that particular client. And I was commended for writing uh, and the amount of learning that I demonstrated. Um, and so I had to kind of pick myself up from that. So I, um, I quit the doctorate because I couldn't do the two at the same time. Of course not. And naturally I had a sense that something, um, that something wasn't right. And, and so I was eventually tested and um, I was diagnosed as dyspraxic, dyslexic, with complex uh, processing disorder. And um, my short-term memory is about 50% below what it should be. Right. So all these things that I thought that were, I've been to A&E 45 times, I fall over my own feet, I fall off a horse, I've fallen off a bike, I've fallen off a boat. Um, um, and so the clumsiness was uh, replaced with dyspraxia and right. the inability to process and put things together coherently um, right. um, is part of the, the dyslexia. 
so yeah um i uh, i had some updates later on but um all said and done i have a thriving little practice um here in wolverhampton um, and i'm quite passionate i've been all around the world i've photographed polar bears I've been to see the orangutans in Borneo. I've had hot air balloon rides, helicopters into Monaco. Um, so even despite that kind of early neglect um, and abusive childhood, I've, I, I'm really thriving. <laughs> menopause, menopause symptoms aside yes. um, and lockdown. Um, yeah, I think Mal's done more than okay. <laughs> You definitely have done more than okay, and you're definitely good enough uh, in every single respect. And so, tell us a, then a little bit more detail about your your business and um, you know the kind of clients that you're working with. The kind of you know what kind of clients would you like more of yeah. <laughs> um you know so people that are listening to this they can they can relate they obviously can relate to you by yeah. now but they may go All right i've got this particular issue and i need to speak to somebody yeah so just so wax lyrical about your business yeah no. i'm a little bit of a bugger because you're supposed to niche but i i haven't i refuse okay. to niche um no i um, think that's good and um, it's not good in terms of marketing because if you niche, then you're talking to one client group, like you're talking to couples. But I'm, uh, and so niching is good for marketing. So I don't do myself any favors, but I'm just not, not picky enough to niche. Right. So, and so, so let me reframe that for you. Yeah. Let me reframe that for you. I think the trouble with marketing speak about niching and going, you really need to know the persona that you're after, you know, and what are their issues and how are you going to solve their issues and, and relate to them specifically. But it's in it's understandable when you've got a physical product that you're aiming at somebody. It might, might not be physical, it might be a service, right? But when it comes to counseling or coaching or mentoring or anything like that, the product is the human being, right? Absolutely. And the human being has such a complex amount of intricate kind of issues yeah. going on that that actually who you're targeting is a human being. That's, That's exactly it. it. And it's not even age specific with me because I've trained in different modalities. So my client range is that my client range varies. Brilliant. Um, it could be I've supported a family whose mum had cancer. Sadly, she, she died last year. So I've been supporting um, um, post, pre and post cancer um, with terminal illness. Mm. I've supported people with work-related stress who come mm. through their insurance companies. I'm registered with all the major insurers. Yeah. Um, I have a, a small contract with a foster care agency. And so I support their um, foster parents and foster families mm. with behavioural issues um, oh, gosh, that are often yeah. emotional issues that translate into mm. uh, behavioural stuff. Um, I've supported couples that are um, having difficulties in their relationships um, to communicate, and you know, we're not we're, we're not we're not taught to tune into each other emotionally. We often get into negative patterns of communicating, like you never, you never, you never. And Esther Perel says behind, behind, behind every criticism is an unexpressed wish. So for me, it's about helping clients to understand who they are, accept mm. themselves, and to really understand their interneurobiology. So I'm a bit of a super therapist. I've had clients say to me, I've learned more in one hour with you than I have in 30 hours of working with somebody else. And that's mm. because I'm a little CPD junkie. And I can tell you that your Barocca region closes wow. down when you're terrified. And so you can't access your thinking brain. You won't be able to remember. You won't have a sex drive. You won't have an appetite. We go into power saving mode mm. in this kind of stressful, uh, kind of hypervigilant or or kind of disassociated states. So when you can normalize this for somebody, when they come to me and say, I'm going mad, and I'm saying, no, this is trauma because you were burgled and you can't sleep and the lack of sleep is affecting your, your mental health so we can prioritize what we need to work on. 
Mm. And under the, the, the kind of the layer underneath all of that is often relational trauma of what's your relationship with yourself like? Mm. Um, because if you don't have a good relationship with yourself, you tend to end up in sabotaging behaviors. We hit the bucket button and we drink too much or we're, we're in those all or nothing patterns and we can't find that middle ground. That's because the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, mm. your timekeeper may not have developed properly. And so actually we drop into the lower kind of uh, spike flight survival brain we can't see past, present, or future. We can't problem solve, and we can't get out of those that place. That's that's trauma in a nutshell. And so we're not just listening to people. We're helping them build new neural pathways, helping them to heal, mm. and giving them the skills to of compassion and gratitude, so that they can show up in their own form, in their own way, and nail it. Um, I, I have so many hang-ups about being professional and being neat and tidy. And actually, I'm kind of slowly tossing those out the window and saying, I'm a bit of a messy things tied up with silly string, but still valuable, still useful, mm. and more than enough. Mm. Mm. Wow, that's, that's a really great bit of summary. Um, I, I love it. And... and I want to just pick on one little thing, if if you don't mind, and that is, you just mentioned something about creating new neural pathways, and correct me if I'm wrong, but these neural pathways need to be hardwired at some stage, so you need to practice it over and over again so it becomes a new habit. You need new limbic experiences. We could do another three hours, Michael. Yes, um, yes, yes. Um, and I'm just aware, hold on. I forgot my laptop plug is here and I haven't got it in so hold on there we go we're safe yeah um, good good 85 percent of your neural pathways are built in the first three years of life yes. but we have brains that are, have a plasticity to, to them yes we have all these systems in our bodies our vestibular vestibule system um all these different systems that have to coordinate to work in order for us to thrive Mm. And so if they don't work, like I, I probably miss some of the crawling stage because of the amount of time I was left in my cart. So right. I'm reading at the moment, is the dis is it are my wrists floppy and unable to hold very weight very well because I'm dyspraxic, or is it trauma because they were never strengthened in those early years? Right. I don't know. Yeah. So yeah, the, the the ability to rewire, we have to un some of us have to unlearn fear. Yeah, there's an unlearning and a relearning and change is actually a much more complicated process than most people will have you believe mm. We, mm. We, it pisses me off immensely all these books that simplify what can be quite complicated mm. and also um, when we're looking at trauma we're not dealing with fear we're dealing with terror mm. we're dealing with nothing in my body is working I cannot breathe I've wet myself I'm having a panic attack I feel sick I need to run. I'm crying all at the same time. That all happened to me the first time I took the mic mm. for a, um, uh, a, a um, an open mic night. I decided to show up and take the microphone. Yes. And I didn't quite wet myself, but I, I had to work so hard to not have a panic attack. And yeah. I had to stand in front of that mic with all those eyes staring at me and go, oh, my God, I'm not sure I can do this. And I was mm. just able to utter the words and name it. I'm terrified. Yeah. And I managed to do the poem, um, a stuttery old poem. They're on YouTube if you want to watch them. Yeah. I, like, I, like, I like to overshare. Um, Good. And so we, um, Rachel Yahada, the epigenetic, epigenetics lady, tells me we are, ma we are weapons of mass reconstruction. Ooh. And so we, I know, what a, what a gorgeous line. Yes. Um, it was worth going to the conference just for that line in itself. By the age of 50, we'll have none of our original brain cells. Wow. So we can eat, we can exercise, we hug, we have sex. They all, build, we run, they all build new brain cells. Mm. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. And so when, we, when we reduce our stress, we, should, we have li these little things called telomeres. They're yes. like the ends on boot strings on your, on your laces, but mm. they're strands of your DNA. Mm. And we lengthen those when we reduce stress. Right. We put less stress on our 
uh, kind of adrenal system when mm. we're when we're not stressed because ad 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 adrenaline comes from your renal system. Yeah. So stress makes us sick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so re having rewired, it you know some of those or the reconstruction weapons of mass reconstruction. I love that. Um, allows us and the and the brain plasticity nothing's impossible basically you no, know, we, well, we and get... i think it's rewiring because yes. i think we are all constant works in progress things happen mm. in our life we, people say to me oh, i've done the work it kind of suggests ignorance we're doing the work and we're constantly doing the work because shit happens and we have mm. to keep recovering but yeah. you get to a point where you have a maybe a more trust in yourself trust in a few other um, individuals that you can get through yeah yeah I'd, I you know <clears throat> so this word trust has come up quite a bit hasn't it and it's I think there is there is a massive bit about trusting yourself um, yeah. to begin with let alone everybody else it's, I, mean, I think it's, it, it, it's yeah it's so multifaceted uh mm -hmm. brene brown's got a lovely seven aspects of trust which i absolutely love it's a good yes. framework i'll pop yeah. it on linkedin maybe and share it um mm -hmm. and yeah the ability to trust yourself um to trust your body uh, when i took that microphone i knew that i was you know the shame would just come up you know yes. my mother's words of no one loves an attention seeker was wow. there yeah 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 and so here, here i am wobbly mal turning up to read a bloody poem and i'm and mal doesn't just choose you know somebody else's poem mal chooses something that's come straight out of her heart and is so bloody vulnerable and um, mm. one of my friends said you don't do things by halves you always mm. call yourself half-hearted but it's so full-hearted um mm. and so yeah um, the, ability, yeah. the whole hearted yeah. And so the ability to trust our own bodies, the ability to trust ourselves and the ability, ability to tolerate the jackasses out there that kind of, you know, um, we haven't even got into gender and being a woman and we're not allowed to swear. We're not allowed to be angry. We're supposed to be kind and polite. I'm going to swear, Michael. Fuck all of that. Mm. Um, yeah. So I think there's so much layers of conditioning that we almost have to wriggle out of our straight jackets to be ourselves. Hundred percent. Yeah. That, yeah. I mean, it's massive. Yeah. And we we're just only you know scratching the surface of it. And yeah, my my fellow brothers, I get disappointed by them every single day. I have to say, um, I don't even want to call them my fellow brothers sometimes. Um, Brilliant. I, I love the kind of, you know, the your your thinking is very unusual, very aligned with the way my, my wife and I think in terms of, you know, and it sounds as well that apart from having learned, you know, having done the courses and everything else that you've done, it's it definitely sounds like you're kind of you know, a long life learner that you're grabbing things from other areas and blending it in with the I knowledge pull, that you yeah, want I pull as well. from so many theories and my own life experience and I, I'm growing and I think one of my clients um, put a recommendation on LinkedIn and it said Mal's a master of her craft craft and has the most insatiable thirst for life. And mm. that's that's so true. I don't have a thirst for a big house in a swimming pool. I'm still living in the same house I had at 19. Mm. But what I do have is a massive now um, adventurer, explorer that mm. wants to have experiences and, and try everything out and visit new continents and ride in hot air balloons and eat fish and chips and watch the sunset. We're all programmed that we need more time and more money um, but yes. Johan Hari's book, Lost Connections, really sums it up. It's that loss of connection to ourselves and to other people that causes the misery. Well, yeah. we already know that we know that money doesn't create happiness. You know, no. it's been proven over and over and over again. But the world has programmed us, society has programmed us, is that's the only way you're going to be good enough. 
we place too much value on the materialistic you know people who say money doesn't matter are generally middle class people with money so i'm going to put a a a, a massive criterion because it certainly mattered when i didn't have a pound for the electricity meter and i couldn't eat yes yes um so be but beyond a point it, it 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 really is about what do you bring to this world what am I, it's took me ages to realize that you know my silly poems my photography mm. mal showing up and saying you're rap- and rooting for other people they're mm. my gifts to the world yes. as messy and as 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 kind of i'm very organized but also very chaotic that's the dyslexia kind of and the complex processing means that i have like five pairs of sunglasses cuz we can we can, sometimes we can't find any um, but it also means even if you're saying there is one part that is is disorganized and there's another part that is organized that means there is balance yeah you know I, I'm, all, I'm organized but what happened it, it took me a long time the neurodiversity answered a lot of questions I'm, I'm chronically organized because that's how you know too much uncertainty and, and I get in a state so I'm kind of like have I got my link what am I doing I've just got a, I've just got Lisa as you know my VA so um, um, knowing what's in my day and, and knowing what, what I've got to do, I know how long, I, know, I even know, I'm super time efficient. I know how long my washing machine takes. Um, but what happens with the neurodiversity is um, I'll, I'll misread stuff. So I missed a plane once because I mixed up the takeoff and the check-in time. Um, and so small Same errors, <laughs> small errors, can 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 spin me but what i used to do was get very ashamed ashamed about that and then having to come out of the shitty shame bucket uh, Mm. would take a long time whereas Mm. now um i hold my robust and vulnerable self in the same body so i can i can be i can sit in a sense i can flip my negatives and that's a, a sense of being able to go oh poor me what about me but i can also then come back to a centered place breathe know that it's it's human and not faulty to feel. And then I can say, what am I grateful for? Yeah. And the hundred percent. And you know, we've, I've been reframing missing a plane as a gift, right? So quick story. We've got a little bit of time. Whilst I'm sharing this story, you have a think about all the um, kind of web links you need to share with us. (laughs) But, um, so I was at I was at Hong Kong airport. I've been there for a few weeks, and uh, went to the check-in counter. I checked my suitcases in, like way far away from the airport, at like the tube. You know, you can yeah. check your suitcases in. Went about my day, and my flight on that day was at uh, five man- minutes past midnight. Right. So I got to the check-in. Now, listen to what I just said. On that day, my flight was at five minutes past midnight. So I went to the airport early evening, got to the checkout. They looked at my ticket, said, sir, you've you've missed your flight. I said, oh, it's not until five past midnight. No, no. Five past midnight today was earlier this morning. Yeah, of course. I totally misread the time. Yeah. So I laughed and I said it was a gift out loud in the queue i went oh my god i laughed i said it was a gift everybody behind me thought this guy's mad uh, they said oh can we have your passport please I said, yeah sure i have my passport they went into some back room i went now nah, i'm in big trouble and um anyway they came out called me up to the desk again and gave me a new ticket for a flight at about 11 o'clock that evening and didn't charge me wow so Sometimes when you call things a gift, even though in the present time yeah, and in that moment, it's the worst thing possible. It doesn't feel like a gift, does it? But It doesn't um, feel like a gift. But I've it, got a, I, I throw in plot twist. This is a plot twist. Oh, um, nice. <laughs> it's a plot twist. And what oh. me and my friend actually did was we're like, you know what? Let's just go on holiday anyway. So we cashed a traveler's check in and went to the bar and had some cocktails and we ended up chatting to the cabin crew who'd come off a shift, who were all in the bar, and ended up having a really nice party. There evening. you go. Got, got the flight the next morning. Yeah. Oh, I, I did leave my passport though in uh, 
uh, on a seat and somebody picked it up and took it to security. So they phoned my sister to say, uh, we found her passport in the airport. She was very cross with me for being drunk in the airport. Right, right, yes. right. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, um, but yeah, uh, so it's a plot twist. It doesn't it's it a can plot feel twist. the worst thing in the world in that moment. But when we can reflect later, yeah. um, often things that feel the end of the world really aren't. Yeah. No. Yeah, no, they just no. feel it in that moment. And it's back to that dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Yes. The overwhelming now that yes. I can't I don't have the the skill set to get out of mm. wiring the wiring to not kind of topple over. Yeah. 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 So that's interesting that you use that word topple, isn't it? Because you talked about your forty five trips to A and E. Yeah. Um that. I often use the word collapse as well. We collapse into shame. You know, mm. when we've done something that we shouldn't have done or we've upset somebody, we tend to, if we've got a quite, if we've had a lot of shame in our history, um, uh, we, there's two uh, kind of, I call it two super highways, the sad mm. and the mad. Mm. And a lot of us, particularly women, I think are wired up for sad. Oh my God, I've upset somebody. And actually what um, finding our mad is more healthy because, you know, when someone's been a, an idiot we can actually say bugger off yeah mm -hmm. you don't mean anything to me bugger off mm -hmm. you don't get to judge me i know who i am yeah well enough to know that your assessment of me is based on one comment you can That's jog right. on. you can jog yeah. on but it's taken yeah. me half a lifetime to feel strong enough to be able to sit in my own self and say off you go <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. i've been reading uh, uh, uh I can't pronounce her surname. There's a, a lovely feminist named Mona. She's Egyptian American. She writ the seven deadly sins of, that women need to to kind of succeed. Yes. And they are profanity and they are um, anger. And that actually we don't get anywhere by just being nice and polite. Mm. Sometimes it's okay to say, F off. Yeah. yeah. If, yeah. if somebody's, somebody was really pushing my boundaries and, and, and actually... I didn't like that what they were saying. And the first time ever on, on LinkedIn, I just said, F off. And somebody mm. said, there's no need for that. I said, there's absolutely every need for it. Mm. I've stated my mm. case. I've, I've stated my boundaries. And the minute someone else oversteps them, I have every right to use whatever language I want to, if you aren't hearing me, to get my point across. Mm. And people don't like that. The world is not ready for gobby women but I'm not shutting up now. I've spent a lot of money in therapy finding my voice and it's still a bit shaky, but it's yeah. here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I th also, it's faster, you know. I mean, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Dutchman, so I'm fairly straight in terms of, you know, my opinion about yeah. things, which people don't, because it's just faster, you know. I'll yeah. just say it how I see it. Yeah. And it may be offensive to somebody. I mean... The part of the problem in I shouldn't make a blanket statement because it's, it's not very true. Briti uh, let's let's bring in culture. British. It's very British to be polite and very yes. well spoken and to be yes. all nice and tidy. And yeah. it's very I love Americans for their directness and their kind of out there. Yes. Um, and so there's a balance because the Americans go a bit over the top as do. well. Yeah, yeah, they can do. Um, and so we can bring in gender and we can bring in cultural influences. Um, yes. You know, when, when, I'm in, when, when I'm in Mexico, I'm like cursing the Americans because I can't hear myself think because the restaurant's full of them and the volume is like, oh, my God, why are they so loud? And my, and my partner laughs at me and says, we're British. Maybe we're really quiet. And I'm like, oh, yeah. 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 Good yeah. point. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it. I went on a on a on a course. Well, I worked for a Japanese company, and they, their English is in, in the company wasn't that good. There were only a few Japanese people, but they all put even the Westerners in the company on a course, the senior team to learn about cultural differences. Yeah. You know, so how do you? There's, there's no word in Japanese for no, apparently, um, but. One of the things we learned in the course is how people make decisions, all the, all the different cultures, how they make decisions. And I learned a lot about, you know, the Brits, the Americans, the Dutch, the Germans, the French, the Spanish, the Japanese, the Chinese, you know, how they all make decisions, whether they make them fast or, you know, don't say no or, you know, make a decision too quickly like the Americans, like, okay, 
go, you know, we're going to yeah. war, let's just do it, type of thing. And the Brits kind of go around the houses a lot. Um, and they described it as, we're going around the hedge, and we'll just keep yeah. looking around the hedge, but the hedge needs cutting. And we'll just keep looking at the hedge and going, mm, today I'm not so sure if it needs cutting yet, you know, so we'll just keep walking around it until we think it's bad yeah. enough, and then we'll cut it. And there's nothing, what clearly, no, a kind of foggy leadership is not useful as we've seen recently. No, no, yeah. and yeah, absolutely. And yeah. I think that this period of time that we're in with COVID is showing up the leadership um, failures around the world, you know? So the one that I'm holding up and holding on to, and I just wish, I'm hoping she's not going to fall down at any stage is- New Zealand? New Zealand, of course. I knew you, yeah, Jacinda. Yeah. Jacinda, yeah. what I a mean, woman! Yeah, it's what amazing. A woman. Yeah. yeah, and it's also my favorite country in the world. I've only been once, and it's like the most beautiful country in the world for me. I haven't and got there yet. I've been to Australia twice. Once was emergency mission to fetch somebody who was very unwell mm. and bring her home. So I wouldn't recommend going to Australia and back in a week. It's exhausting. Oh my god! Um, but New Zealand um, is definitely on my list. Yeah. I've highly, snookered, highly recommend. I've snookered myself. I've got two traumatized doggies that I don't have any dog care for at the moment, so I can't travel anywhere. Well, I can travel on my own, but myself and my partner can't go anywhere together because we don't have dog care yet. We've got <sighs> some rehab work to do first. Oh wow! <laughs> wow! 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 Okay, so you're right. We could speak for hours on the, the various <laughs> topics, and I just have one really, really quick question, and that go is. For it. Perhaps you could help people with some advice and maybe one or two tips. So obviously the, the period that we're going through is a very stressful period with COVID, coronavirus, whatever you want to call it. And there's lots of stresses that people are yeah. finding themselves in, whether it's homeschooling children, whether it's work, whether it's being stuck in Spain, being, you know, go, having to quarantine, um, not getting travel insurance, whatever it might be and there's so many so many stresses and challenges for people how do they deal with it mel i think i can only say how i deal with it and hope it helps um, mm. um i think a we have to sometimes shut off the noise because it's overwhelming um if you if, if all the media attention um can have us think that the world has gone to shit in a handbasket and maybe we're right but it's too overwhelming. And so actually shutting that down for a little bit and just going into your garden and checking on your tomatoes if you garden, reading a book. Mm. Um, a lot of people will struggle to concentrate if they're agitated and anxious. So it's a, maybe about focusing on uh, some breathing, calming down our central nervous systems, drawing a really big crayon around yourself and dis uh, in a bubble and deciding what you let in and what you keep out so you stay well. I also think it's very much about what fits for you. We get mm. so caught up in everybody else's, um, you know, everybody else is doing it better than me. I've seen so much horrible stuff about you're, you're a selfish asshole if you don't wear a mask. Mm. Um, I don't wear a mask, but then I don't actually go to the store because I don't mm. want to be the selfish ass asshole that's not wearing a mask. So actually mm. I choose not to not to go to the store. Mm. Um, so let's be less judgy of other people and less judgy of ourselves. Mm. And whatever you need to do to feel safe and to survive or thrive is okay. It, mm. It's not about, you know, how I do it isn't going to be how she does it over there or he does it over there. So, you know, if you're ready to go out in the world and wear your mask and, and pick up and life feels more normal for you, that's great. But be yeah. respectful of the people who are maybe further behind and aren't ready to go out there. Maybe for good reason. I've had some pressure to open up my therapy room again. And I've said, no, I'm not ready. My yeah. partner's asthmatic. Um, I don't want to. I'm staying online for now. And, yeah. and that's a decision that I choose to make that keeps me safe and yeah. me well. And so it's about us really working with our own thresholds of what is useful for us. I have a really um, useful saying where I think it's useful, when the going gets tough, the self-care has to go way off. Yeah. Right. And the, and the expectations for ourselves may have to go lower. I was on a call with about 18 head teachers, which scared the pants off me. I'm like, oh, head teachers. Um, <laughs> and they were all saying they were, they were exhausted by fatigue 
the Zoom calls are exhausting. Mm. Um, there's so much more work to do. And they didn't feel they could take care of their mental health. And I said to them, it's not a choice because um, I know what it's like to be in psychiatric trying to repair. You know, do you want six months in psychiatric? Because that shit happens. And so um, kind of prevention is so much better than cure. Right. Um, you have to look after yourself. It may be about conversations with other people. Reach out to – don't sit in silence either. If you can trust somebody else um, – talk about it yeah. um it's it'll normalize it it will make you feel less alone i know that's not easy i I've, I've been um i've decided to come out about menopause symptoms rather than suffer in silence and it's actually been such a normalizing experience to other people say yes it's pants too and have you tried this or what about that mm. so i think yeah um all of us um need to take care of ourselves and do what fits for us and, yes. and, and, and and be less judgy about why someone, you don't know why. I and mean, I've shared quite openly why I don't like having things over my face. Mm. I could absolutely do it if it was life or death, but I don't want to. So I choose not to. Sure. And so it's, you know, the judgments at the moment, I think um, I heard somebody say, you know, I saw somebody, I, I really wanted to spit, but I was like, just, just rise above it. Somebody saying, you know, oh, these idiots have gone to Spain and have to quarantine. They went to Spain and somebody changed the rules. That's not actually their fault. No. Um, and so people are, are really hurting at the moment and they're really struggling. And so this, all, you know, we can either react or we can respond. Yeah. Yeah. Great. And so the reactions are projections of our pain. Oh, well, it's all right for these people who can afford to go on holiday. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you're moaning about having to work from home. There's loads of people who can't work from home. So whatever you say at the moment, your chances are <laughs> mm. somebody somewhere might be triggered by it. Yeah. yeah. 100%. The That's pain good. points are just constantly moving around for everyone. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. That's really, really great advice. Thank you so much for that. I think that will really help people. Um, so really need to capture that. I, I appreciate you sharing that with us. So Mel, where can people find you if they need some virtual assistance? <laughs> I'm on, um, they can find me on LinkedIn. I'm Mel Riley, um, counseling. They can find me on Twitter. I'm MJ counseling on there. Um, they can go to my website, which is maljriley.co.uk and um, all contact numbers for emails and phone numbers are on there for me. Brilliant. Fantastic. I will include all of those in the show notes. Uh, oh, thank you, sure. Michael. Um, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's, and thank you so much for sharing so openly your story with all the pain that you've gone through. Yeah. But I'm so pleased that you're coming out the other end or have come out the other end. And I know it's a constant work in progress. We're human beings. Yeah. Um, but that you've got a thriving kind of practice and that you're helping people which is most yeah. important yeah making a difference which yeah. is which is kind of makes it's it's that circle isn't it what we put in the world comes back to us yeah yeah absolutely yeah. so well hopefully we'll see each other in person one day i'd love that <laughs> um but for now um thank you so much for coming on the podcast and uh, speak to you very soon thank you take care for now bye Bye-bye. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.